Story 1. There's embarking on our yearly expedition, a cherished ritual rooted in our college days. We sought adventure and a respite from the humdrum of everyday existence. This year found us venturing onto a secluded trail, shrouded in mystery and boasting the charm of pristine will, united by a friendship born of youthful enthusiasm and cemented by collective experiences. We five entered nature's sanctuary, our hearts buoyant and spirits soaring. The initial day progressed as anticipated, filled with laughter that reverberated through the forest and the rhythmic crunch of leaves beneath our feet, crafting an anthem of liberation as twilight approached. We established our camp, the sky above us awash with hues of blazing orange and tranquil purples. The air was thick with stories and jests, wrapping us in a warm embrace of the familiar. Yet, as the night deepened, a disconcerting quietude enveloped us, a silence so profound it seemed to stir our knees, as though the very forest was holding its breath in anticipation. On the morrow, we encountered a trail, absent from our maps, its existence almost a hushed counterpoint to the wilderness's imposing narrative. Driven by insatiable curiosity, we followed its serpentine path further into the forest's depths than we had ever seen this secluded enclave, shielded by the forest's dense canopy and the watchful gaze of venerable trees that we discovered a concealed village, its presence revealed only to those directly upon its verge. The instant we came into view, the atmosphere grew dense, laden with an implicit menace. Observant eyes scrutinized us from the shadows and inhabitants paused, their faces etched with surprise and weariness. Her figure emerged, exuding authority, his penetrating stare unsettling. You shouldn't be here, he uttered, his voice imbued with caution. In our attempt to justify our presence and withdrawal, we found the path altered, its layout now bewildering, challenging our recollection. A surge of panic overwhelmed me, akin to a bird ensnared under escort. We were led to the village's heart, where Elias, identifying himself as the leader, made it evident through his demeanor that our arrival was not merely unwelcome, but perceived as a menace. As darkness enveloped us, we were confined within a small hut, its windows secured, the exit locked externally. The grim reality dawned on us. We were captives in a realm oblivious to the external world. Our conversations morphed into hushed schemes of escape, born out of sheer desperation. The ensuing days melded into a fraught standoff, under the constant vigilance of those who deemed us interlopers. Though sustenance was provided, each morsel was imbued with dread. We learned of the community's long-standing seclusion, their secrets zealously protected, inciting a cold dread within us. To them, outsiders were akin to a malady, a peril to their existence, to be neutralized if deemed necessary. Their attempts at dialogue to assure them of our benign intentions were met with indifference. Guided by Elias's directive, the community acted as a unified entity, viewing us as harbingers of their potential discovery, deprived of our technological means. Our appeals for contact with the external world were summarily rejected, or was each day blurred into the next under a veil of tension and clandestine strategy. Our determination only grew stronger. The concept of escape transformed from a mere glimmer of hope into our singular goal. We meticulously observed their patterns, the changing of guards, and those fleeting moments when vigilance seemed to wane, finding in these brief lapses of fragile yet persistent hope on a night shrouded by the darkness of a new moon, we seized our chance. Sarah, with her exceptional agility, managed to loosen the window bars. Previously weakened through days of careful manipulation, stealthily, we exited one by one, blending with the night, our pounding hearts threatening to give us away. The forest, once a heaven of natural splendor, now presented itself as an ominous labyrinth, filled with shadowy dangers. The sound of a breaking twig underfoot echoed like an alarm. Driven by both the celestial guidance above and an intrinsic will to persevere, we pressed, however, as the lights of the community became distant, a chilling realization dawned on us. We were not unaccompanied. Elias, whose strategies were sharpened by years of seclusion, had foreseen our attempt to flee. From the darkness, figures appeared not armed with hostility but with an intimate knowledge of the land, transforming the wilderness into an inescapable fort. Every route we chose led us in circles, 
every direction ended in impasse. The forest, an extension of their domain, ensnared us within its natural barricade. Trapped and with options dwindling, we found ourselves at the brink of a precipitous gorge, the earth beneath us threatening to give way. The community's members approached, their intentions not to harm but to guide us back. Elias, illuminated by the moon's glow, revealed a countenance marked by complexity. Leaving is not within your reach, he declared, his words tinged with an unexpected melancholy. Not out of malice, but because you now bear the weight of our secret, a burden too immense for your shoulder. This tense standoff was unexpectedly diffused by an unforeseen advocate, a young woman from the community, whose gaze had lingered on us with a distinctive blend of inquisitiveness and empathy, stepped forth. There exists another route, she offered softly, her voice a slender beacon of hope amid our dire straits. She guided us along the verge of the gorge to a concealed trail, obscured by dense undergrowth, unnoticed by their sentinels. Follow this path to freedom, she instructed, her gaze laden with a complex mix of apprehension and boldness. But heed this warning, you must never return, for the safety of both our people and yours. Navigating the hidden path was perilous, a journey through underbrush and tangled roots evidencing the community's lengths to remain undiscovered. As dawn's first light pierced the canopy, the wilderness gradually receded, unveiling a world untouched by the secluded community's presence. Weary, marked by the ordeal but alive, we stepped out of the forest embrace into the rising sun, its light scattering the remnants of fear. The external world, now seemingly more vivid and cacophonous, felt like a realm we had momentarily forgotten. Her entry into society was met with incredulity and questions that we could not wholly address. The forest and its concealed inhabitants became a quietly spoken chapter of our lives, a profound bond forged through shared adversity. This experience altered us indelibly, leaving marks both seen and unseen. Yet, in the wake of our ordeal and amidst the flurry of readjustment and speculative whispers, we harbored a deep-seated respect for the sanctity of concealed existences and the extreme measures some undertake to preserve them. What began as a quest for adventure had morphed into a grave lesson on survival, a poignant reminder of the fine line between the pursuit of discovery and the respect for unseen boundaries. Story 2 the thrill of transitioning into my very own apartment was undeniable. Situated on the top floor, this charming abode, awash with natural light and nestled in the city's vibrant heart, was the embodiment of my aspirations. Despite the bustling activity below, there existed a soothing hum that brought the evenings to life, making everything feel simultaneously distant yet comforting. As I settled in, organizing my possessions, a profound sense of autonomy enveloped me, exhilarating yet daunting in its newness. The initial weeks flew by in a haze of establishing new routines and savoring the solitude of my living situation. I ventured through my new locale, discovering quaint cafes and serene parks perfect for immersion in literature or introspection. Each return to my abode felt like entering a personal haven a feeling of solace that persisted until an unsettling discovery disrupted this tranquility. When an ordinary Thursday, amidst a pile of inconsequential mail, I encountered a plain white envelope, distinguished only by my name in a peculiar, delicate script, devoid of a sender's address. Driven by curiosity, I opened it, half expecting a neighborly gesture of welcome, or instead the message within sent an icy shiver through me. I've been watching you. You look so peaceful in your new home. I tried to dismiss it as a poorly conceived jest, perhaps from an acquaintance aiming to startle me. Yet the anticipated laughter never materialized, only an oppressive silence as I pondered the note anew. That evening, I secured the doors and windows, a precaution previously deemed unnecessary in my secure high-rise retreat. A week lapsed without further occurrences allowing the letter to fade into an uncomfortable memory. However, a new disturbance soon presented itself, a nondescript package, evoking unease as it awaited me. Bring the same unsettling script, it contained photographs of me going about my daily routines, a stark revelation of my being surveilled. This breach transformed my haven into a cage. Restlessness ensued, with every sound magnifying my apprehension. Despite reporting to the authorities, 
The absence of concrete leads rendered their efforts futile. The sensation of invisible eyes upon me intensified, a pervasive dread that clouded my existence. Subsequent correspondences and parcels brought increasingly personal insights into my life, a silent observer chronicling my every action. This relentless surveillance cast a shadow over my every moment, the perpetrator remaining an elusive phantom skirting my reserve of companionship from friends were met with reluctance, my fear of endangering them too great. One unremarkable evening marked a harrowing escalation. Upon my return, the apartment's atmosphere was definitely altered, a sinister presence betraying its intrusive sight of a shadow beneath my bedroom door, where none should exist, rooted me in place, an overwhelming urge to escape clashing with the realization of my entanglement in this pervasive menace. This ordeal had entwined the stalker so deeply into my life's fabric, leaving me ensnared in a terrifying predicament with no evident escape. For summoning courage I didn't know I possessed, I retreated silently as I called 911 from the only room with a lock besides the front door whose key I had just struggled with. My trembling hands betrayed my forced whisper as I relayed my situation to the operator, clinging to the last thread of hope. The wait for police felt like eternity, every second amplified by fear of what noise might bring my nightmare closer. But force of police searched my apartment, they discovered my front door unlocked, confirming my worst fear. My apartment was empty save for a new letter, bearing his terrifying scrawl on my always vacant back. I was so close to you, a taunt, a threat, an assurance of more to come. For days turned into a blur of police interviews, replaced locks and sleepless nights. My friend's couches became my safe haven as I was too terrified to return to my apartment. The police were sympathetic but feeble, their hands tied without evidence or even a suspect. My stalker was a ghost leaving no trace beyond the psychological scars that deepened with each letter, each violation. Determined to reclaim my life and no longer willing to be a victim, I installed security cameras, a decision that would soon reveal the horrifying truth. The footage captured my stalker, a figure cloaked in darkness, moving through my apartment with a chilling familiar. But it was the moment the intruder turned towards a camera, face obscured by a mask, that my blood ran cold. The build the gate. It was someone from my building, someone I passed in the hallway with a smile, unknowingly greeting my tormentor with neighborly kindness. The revelation shattered my trust in the safety of community, the comfort of familiar faces. I confronted my stalker with the police by my side, a confrontation that led to their arrest but offered no true solace. A man, a neighbor who lived just two floors below, confessed to an obsession that had spiraled into the nightmare that consumed my life. His apartment was a shrine to his surveillance, walls covered in photos of me, notes detailing his delusions of a relationship that existed only in his disturbed mind. The response that followed was to move, leave behind the city, the apartment, and the illusion of safety that was stolen so carelessly. In the aftermath was the trauma, a shadow that walked with me, a whisper in the silence became the fortress I rebuilt piece by piece in a world that seemed now crowded with unseen threats. It taught me of the resilience of the human spirit, the strength we can find in places darkened by despair. It taught me too of the darkness that can find its way into the ordinary corners of our lives, where the monsters wear the masks of everyday faces. My tale is one of survival, of a battle to reclaim the peace stolen from me and a reminder of the vigilance that we all owe one another. In a world where the danger can come from the last place you expect, Re 3. The first hint of the Eldridge disappearances came from a tiny column in a local paper, easily missed among the splasher headlines. It talked about three people going missing in a month from Eldridge, a town so off the beaten path it hardly showed up on maps, curious about the scant details. I thought it could be a compelling piece for the magazine I write for. Little did I know. This curiosity would pull me into a story darker and more twisted than anything I'd expected. Burge was quiet, the kind of quiet where even the wind seems to be keeping secrets. The folks there were tight-lipped, quickly looking away whenever I brought up the missing people. They were scared, that much was obvious, but of what, or whom, I had yet to figure out. The game changed when I met Mrs. Weaver, a librarian who'd spent her whole life in Eldridge. 
over coffee that tasted like it had been brewed a week ago. She spilled the beans about an old military base just outside town, abandoned since the Cold War. It had been taken over by a cult known as the Order of the True Light, who were all about purifying humanity by cutting it off from the supposedly corrupt world outside. Driven by a mix of journalistic curiosity and a creeping sense of unease, I made my way to the base. The closer I got, the quieter it became, until all I could hear was my own footsteps. The place was a ghost town of rundown buildings and overgrown runways, but it was the partly open door to the underground bunkers that grabbed my attention. Her side, it was like stepping back in time. The air was musty, and the only light came from my flashlight flickering over old propaganda posters about the virtues of solitude. The living quarters were the most chilling part. Personal stuff was just lying around, and kids' drawings were stuck on the walls. A stark contrast to the craziness of the cult's beliefs. I eventually found a big room with chairs all facing an altar with a book full of end-of-the-world ramblings. Then, whispers led me to a locked door. Behind it, I found the missing townsfolk, alive but shattered. They shared their stories of being kidnapped by the cult, told that the world outside had ended, and that they were the chosen ones. But their captor's disappearance left them forgotten underground, leading them out into daylight. The story I penned blew the lid off the order of the true light, sparking a nationwide probe. Eldridge began to heal, stepping out from under the cult's long shadow. For me, the darkness of that bunker lingered. The tales of those I helped rescue are a constant reminder of how deep belief can spiral into madness. This ordeal taught me about human resilience. Despite everything, the survivors were piecing their lives back together, a testament to their strength against the cult's manipulation. This wasn't just a story about missing people or a deranged cult. It was a deeper commentary on human nature, the fine line between belief and insanity. It underscored the reality that the most horrifying stories are often true, lurking just beneath the surface of everyday life. As a journalist, it's my job to uncover these stories no matter how dark. Because by shading light on the darkness, we learn to appreciate the light even more. Bure 4 our road trip to Grand Canyon, meant to be a fun family adventure, turned into something out of a horror movie. It was just me, my wife Sarah, and our kids, Em and Jack. They were all hyped up, unable to stop chatting as we drove from the busy city landscapes to quiet farmlands, and finally into the stark beauty of the desert. We were making good time, driving through the night with the kids asleep in the back, when we decided to stop for gas in a tiny town so off the radar at it wasn't even on our map. The gas station was spooky quiet. With just one flickering light, I was filling up the tank and Sarah went inside to pay. That's when our night took a turn straight into nightmare territory. We heard a scream, abruptly cut off. Sarah came out looking as shaken as I felt. We probably should have just driven off, but something, curiosity maybe, or a feeling that we needed to help, made us check it out. Driving through the town felt like being in a ghost story, with its deserted streets and shadowy buildings. At the end of the road, we found an old warehouse with lights and shouting coming from inside. I left Sarah and the kids in the car and took a closer look, only to see something terrifying. A group of men around someone tied up and scared, I was spotted, and suddenly it was all about getting out of there fast. We tried to escape, but they were ready for us. With weapons in hand, they blocked our way. In that moment, it hit me how serious our situation was. Sarah whipped the car around and floored it. What followed was a chase straight out of an action movie, but all we wanted was to get away and protect our kid. Eventually, we had to ditch the car and make a run for it. Hiding in the desert, every sound made us jump, fearing they'd find us. But they didn't, and by dawn, we were alone but far from okay. Making our way back to safety, we were a mix of relief, exhaustion, and disbelief over what had happened. Her story led to an investigation that revealed the dark underbelly of that small town. Telling this tale now, I feel a mix of catharsis and a shiver remembering the close call. What was supposed to be a memorable family trip turned into a stark reminder of the unpredictability of life and the resilience we didn't know we had. It changed us, made us stronger together but also left us with shadows that linger.
Story 5. I was in my final year of college when the opportunity came up. A clinical trial for a new medication claimed to enhance cognitive functions, reduce anxiety, and improve focus. The compensation was generous, enough to cover my remaining tuition and then some, I didn't hesitate. I saw it as a win-win. I could contribute to scientific progress while securing my financial future. How naive I was. The initial assessments were thorough, involving numerous health checks and psychological evaluations. I was deemed a perfect candidate. They were looking for healthy young adults with no underlying conditions, and I fit the bill. The trial conducted by a reputable pharmaceutical company promised close monitoring and immediate action any sign of adverse effects. Comforted by their professionalism and potential benefits, I signed on. The first few days were uneventful. I took the pill every morning, attended my classes, and went about my daily routines. If anything, I felt an uptick in my energy levels and concentration. My grades improved and so did my mood. It was everything they promised, until it wasn't. About two weeks in, the nightmares began. Vivid, terrifying dreams that felt all too real. I would wake up drenched in sweat, heart pounding, unable to distinguish the nightmare from reality. I reported these to the trial supervisors, who noted my concerns but assured me it was a temporary side effect, likely due to the body adjusting to the medication. But the nightmares were just the beginning. I started hearing whispers, faint at first, then growing louder, more insistent. They were indecipherable, a background noise that followed me throughout the day. I couldn't focus in class. I couldn't enjoy moments with my friends. The whispers turned into voices, accusing, threatening, always just out of sight. I was terrified, convinced I was losing my mind. I reached out to the trial supervisors again, more insistent this time. They seemed concerned, but suggested it might be stress-related, not necessarily a side effect of the medication. They offered counseling, but insisted I continue with the trial. I felt trapped. The compensation, once a blessing, now felt like a chain binding me to this nightmare. It escalated quickly from there. I started seeing things, shadows moving in the corner of my eye, figures standing at the end of my bed, watching me. I couldn't sleep. I could barely eat. I was a shell of my former self, jumping at the slightest sound, flinching at shadows. My academic performance plummeted. My relationships suffered, and I isolated myself afraid of what I might see or hear in the presence of others. First, I demanded to be taken off a trial, but the company was evasive. They claimed they needed more data, that my experiences, while unfortunate, were invaluable to their research. I felt betrayed, a guinea pig sacrificed for the sake of progress. My pleas for help were met with reassurances that they were doing everything they could. But behind their words, I sensed a desperation to keep their project on track regardless of the cost to participants like me. The breaking point came one night when the hallucinations became so intense I couldn't tell if I was awake or dreaming. The shadows took form, whispering, taunting, reaching for me. I locked myself in the bathroom, the only place I felt somewhat safe, and called the emergency number provided by the trial supervisors. What followed was a blur of activity. I was removed from the trial, hospitalized for observation, and given medication to counteract the effects of the trial drug. In the weeks that followed, I learned I wasn't the only participant experiencing severe side effects. The company had tried to downplay the incidents, attributing them to unrelated mental health issues or external stressors, but as more of us came forward, sharing our stories, the pattern became undeniable. The medication was dangerous, and the company had known, choosing to risk our health for the sake of their research. The trial was eventually shut down, but the damage was done. Many of us were left dealing with the aftermath, the psychological scars not easily healed. The company faced lawsuits and public backlash, but no amount of compensation could undo the harm. I've since graduated, my life slowly returning to some semblance of normalcy, but the experience left its mark. I'm wary of the promises made by those in power the sacrifices they're willing to make in the name of progress. I share my story not for sympathy, but as a warning. Behind the facade of innovation and advancement, there are individuals, human lives being toyed with. We must question, scrutinize, and hold accountable those who would put their ambitions above our well-being. Three six. 
her life as a single parent was a balancing act, a constant juggle of work, childcare, and the rare moments of personal time. When Alex walked into my life, it felt like a breath of fresh air, a chance at happiness I hadn't dared to dream of. They were kind, attentive, and wonderful with my child, Jamie. For the first time in years, the future seemed bright. We met at a local coffee shop, a chance encounter that quickly blossomed into something more. Alex was new in town, eager to start over after a series of unspecified personal troubles. I didn't pry. We all had our pasts, after all. Her presence brought laughter and warmth back into our home, and Jamie adored them. It seemed like fate. But then the rumors started. Hushed whispers at the school gates, sidelong glances at the grocery store. They said Alex had a dark past, one shrouded in suspicion and whispers of violence. Allegations of murder, never proven but never quite dismissed, or so my heart refused to believe it. This was not the Alex I knew, the person who had become my rock, my partner in every sense. I confronted Alex, needing to hear the truth from them. The pain in their eyes was palpable as they recounted the story of a life unraveled by suspicion. Years ago in another town, a close friend of theirs had been found dead under mysterious circumstances. Alex was the last person seen with the victim, making them the prime suspect in the investigation. Despite a lack of evidence, the allegations alone were enough to destroy their reputation, forcing them to leave everything behind in search of a new start. Listening to Alex, I saw the toll it had taken on them, the weight of being forever marked by an accusation. They had come here seeking a fresh start, a chance to rebuild away from the whispers and stares. When my initial shock gave way to empathy, the Alex I knew was incapable of such violence, a gentle soul who had shown us nothing but love and kindness. Yet, doubt is a persistent shadow. It crept into my thoughts at night whispering what-ifs and painting scenarios too horrifying to entertain. Could I truly know someone? Was I putting my child at risk based on faith alone? The community's suspicions became my own, an undercurrent of fear in the life we were building together. In search of peace of mind, I delved into Alex's past myself, contacting old acquaintances and piecing together the story from before. What I found was a tale of tragedy, not malice. Alex's friend had been troubled, their death a culmination of personal demons rather than foul play. Alex had been a convenient scapegoat, an outsider then as they were now. The realization brought clarity, and, with it, a decision. I chose to stand by Alex, to face the whispers and judgment as a united front. Love, I learned, was not just about the easy moments, but about finding strength in adversity about believing in someone when the world turned against them. As we moved forward, the rumors eventually faded into the background, replaced by the mundane realities of life. Our bond grew stronger, forged in the fires of trial and understanding. Jamie thrived, oblivious to the storms that had once threatened us. In the end, our little family emerged resilient, a testament to the power of love and forgiveness. Three, seven. The allure of the abandoned Marabrook Asylum was irresistible to us. A group of urban explorers drawn to the forgotten and forsaken corners of the world. Its history was marred by tales of mistreatment and strange occurrences, a beacon for those like us seeking thrills in the shadows of the past, armed with cameras and flashlights. We breached its perimeter under the cloak of night, unaware that this exploration would be unlike any other. The asylum loomed before us a monolithic structure of decaying beauty and whispered secrets. Its windows, like the eyes of the forgotten, stared out into the darkness, challenging us to uncover its hidden tales. We entered through a breach in the security fence, our footsteps echoing in the silent anticipation of the night. Inside, the air was thick with the weight of unspoken stories, the walls peeling with layers of despair. We ventured deeper, drawn by the magnetic pull of the unknown, where lights pierced the darkness revealing the remnants of lives once lived within these walls. Abandoned beds, scattered belongings, and the oppressive sense of being walked. As we delved into the heart of the asylum, a sudden chill swept through the corridors, a whisper of the unseen. Laughter, soft and menacing, echoed off the walls, a sound with no source but the shadows themselves. We pressed on, dismissing it as the tricks of an anxious mind. 
until the building itself seemed to turn against us. Doors that once stood open slammed shut, trapping us within its bowels. Efforts to retrace our steps were futile. The layout twisted and turned, a labyrinth designed to confound and confuse. Panic began to set in, the realization that we were not alone in this place of forgotten sorrow. The laughter grew louder, joined by the sound of footsteps that were not our own. Shadows danced at the edge of our vision, figures glimpsed but never fully seen. We were being hunted, pursued by something that dwelled in the asylum, something that had never left. Our unity fractured in the face of fear, the group splintering as we sought our own escape. It was in this division that the asylum revealed its true horror. One by one, we were found not by each other, but by the inhabitants of the shadows. Their touch was cold, their whispers a cacophony of madness and despair. I found myself alone, the screams of my friends a distant echo. The realization dawned on me then, a truth more terrifying than any ghost. The asylum was alive, fed by the tragedies within its walls, sustained by the fear of those who dared to walk its... In a final act of desperation, I found my way to the roof, the city lights a distant reminder of the world beyond. As dawn broke, the asylum's grip loosened, the doors unlocking as if releasing me from its embrace. I emerged the sole survivor, forever changed by the night spent in the heart of Merrow Brook Asylum. The fate of my friends remains a mystery, their screams a haunting melody that follows me in the quiet moments. I've left the world of urban exploration behind, but the asylum refuses to leave me. It's there in my dreams, a silent sentinel, a reminder of the night we ventured into the darkness and found ourselves lost in the echoes of the past. Story 8 Working the night shift at St. Mary's Hospital was like living in a different world. The bustling corridors of the day gave way to shadowed silence, punctuated only by the soft beeps of machines and the occasional murmur of a waking patient. I found solace in the routine, the quiet allowing me time to care for my patients with a level of intimacy the daylight hours never afforded. But that tranquility was shattered when a pattern of unexplained patient deaths began to emerge, casting a dark shadow over my night. It started subtly a sense of unease that crept up on me during my rounds. Patients who were recovering, showing signs of improvement, would suddenly take turns for the worse, their conditions rapidly deteriorating until it was too late. Officially, these were unfortunate setbacks, tragic but not uncommon in a hospital setting. Yet, the frequency of these incidents began to gnaw at me, a whisper in the back of my mind that something was amiss. The breakthrough came on a particularly quiet night. Mrs. Henderson, a sweet elderly lady recovering from surgery, had been doing remarkably well. Her recovery was ahead of schedule, and there was talk of discharging her by the end of the week. But when I checked on her in the early hours, I found her struggling for breath, her face contorted in distress. The rapid response team couldn't save her, and the cause of death was chalked up to a sudden cardiac event. Is a blow, not just to the staff, but to me personally. Mrs. Henderson had reminded me of my own grandmother, and her unexpected passing left a heavy weight in my heart. Rumors among the staff started to swirl, whispers of a curse or bad luck plaguing our ward. But I couldn't accept the supernatural explanations or chalk it up to mere coincidence. We began to pay closer attention, noting the similarities in the cases, the unexplained declines, and, most importantly, the staff present during each incident. That's when I noticed Dr. Harper, a relatively new addition to our night team. Charismatic and well-liked, he had quickly become a favorite among the staff. Yet, as I pieced together the timeline, his shifts aligned too perfectly with the unexpected deaths. At first, I chided myself for even considering the possibility. Dr. Harper was a respected professional, dedicated to his patients. But the nagging doubt wouldn't leave me. One night, determined to lay my suspicions to rest, I decided to follow Dr. Harper more closely, under the guise of seeking his advice on patient care. It was during one of these observations that I caught a glimpse of something that chilled me to the bone. In the dim light of a patient's room, I saw Dr. Harper administer an injection, his actions too deliberate, too final. The patient, Mr. Jenkins, had been stable, yet within minutes of Dr. Harper's visit, his monitors began to blare the warning signs of distress. 
I reported my observations to the hospital administration, my heart heavy with the weight of my accusations. An internal investigation was launched, and what they uncovered was horrifying. Du Harper had been using his position to conduct a twisted form of mercy killing, choosing patients he believed were suffering unnecessarily. His actions were methodical, calculated to appear as natural complications. The hospital was rocked by the scandal, the trust in our care shattered by the actions of one man. In the aftermath, I struggled with my own guilt. Had I been more vigilant, could I have stopped him sooner? The administration praised my courage, crediting me with preventing further tragedies, but the accolades felt hollow, the damage to our patients and their families irreparable. The night shift never felt the same after that. The shadows seemed darker, the silence oppressive. I transferred to the day shift not long after, seeking refuge in the light and noise. Yet, the events of those nights followed me, a somber reminder of the fragility of life and the darkness that can lurk behind a friendly smile. Story 9 The day started like any other in the sleek, glass-paneled offices of Nextech Solutions. As a software engineer, my world revolved around lines of code, debugging, and the relentless pursuit of evasion. Our latest project, a cutting-edge social media platform, promised to redefine digital interaction. I was proud of our work, believing we were creating something that would connect people in meaningful ways. But that pride turned to horror when I stumbled upon something deeply unsettling hidden deep within our code base. It was an anomaly, a sophisticated surveillance program disguised so cleverly among thousands of lines of code that it was almost imperceptible. This wasn't just a tool for gathering user metrics or enhancing user experience. It was designed to spy on users collecting intimate details of their lives without their consent. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. My company, which prided itself on user privacy and ethical standards, was involved in something sinister. I dug deeper, driven by a mix of curiosity and dread, and discovered that this program was not just a rogue experiment gone awry. It was systematic, approved at the highest levels, and it was being used to stalk users gathering information for reasons I couldn't yet fathom. We waited the discovery was crushing. I had to act, but I knew the risks. Blowing the whistle could mean the end of my career, legal battles, or worse. But the thought of staying silent, of being complicit in such a violation of trust, was unbearable. I compiled evidence, documenting everything with meticulous care, and sought advice from a trusted friend outside the company. Their reaction confirmed my fears. This was big, potentially scandalous. They urged caution, warning me of the lengths to which the company might go to protect its secrets. I knew they were right. Their stories of whistleblowers faced with intimidation, legal action, and personal threats flashed through my mind. Yet, the alternative, living with the guilt of inaction, was not an option. I decided to leak the information to a journalist known for their integrity and work on privacy issues. It was a calculated risk, but it paid off. The story broke, sending shockwaves through the tech industry and the pub. There was outrage, calls for accountability, and a spotlight on the dark side of the digital age. The company's response was swift and predictable. Denials, followed by admissions of oversights and promises of internal investigations. But for me, the fallout was immediate and personal. My identity as the source of the leak was discovered leading to my termination and a series of legal threats designed to silence me. I was vilified by some, hailed as a hero by others. My career in tech was over, but I found solace in the belief that I had done the right thing. As the legal battles ensued, and the debate over digital privacy raged on, I realized the true cost of my actions. But even in the face of personal and professional ruin, I would make the same choice again. With the right to privacy, to live without the fear of being watched, is a fundamental human right. In the end, I had exposed a threat to that right, and in doing so, I had found a new purpose. Story 10. The breakup was the kind that leaves you hollow, questioning not just the relationship, but your very sense of self. Same was my everything for years, and then suddenly, they weren't. The reasons were as cliche as they come, growing apart, wanting different things. 
the love that once burned fiercely between us reduced to cold ash. I tried to move on, filling my days with work, friends, and the mindless scroll of social media. But Sam's absence was a gaping hole nothing could fill. It started a few weeks after the breakup. I was at our favorite coffee shop, the one with the mismatched chairs and the too strong espresso we loved. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of someone who looked just like Sam. Same height, same hair, the same way of standing. My heart leaped into my throat. I turned, ready to call out their name, but the crowd swallowed them up, and when I reached the spot where they'd been, there was no one there who even remotely resembled my ex. I chalked it up to wishful thinking, my brain playing cruel tricks on me, but it kept happening. At the grocery store, the library, even jogging in the park. Fleeting glimpses of someone who moved like Sam, laughed like Sam, wore the kind of clothes Sam would wear. Each sighting was a jolt of adrenaline, a spark of irrational hope quickly doused by reality. I never got close enough to confirm it was them, and no matter how fast I chased these apparitions, they always vanished before I could catch up. My friends told me it was normal, a phase of the grieving process. They said our minds often play tricks on us during times of emotional turmoil, seeing what we most desperately want to see. I tried to believe them, to convince myself that it was all in my head, but the sightings became more frequent, more unsettling. It felt like I was being haunted by Sam's ghost, a constant reminder of what I'd lost. The turning point came one evening as I was walking home from work. The street was nearly deserted, the fading light casting long shadows on the pavement. Ahead of me, I saw them again. Sam, or someone who bore an uncanny resemblance, standing under a street light, looking right at me, but my heart stopped. This was no fleeting glimpse, no trick of the light. They were real, tangible. So close I could see the expression on their face, a mix of sadness and longing that mirrored my... I quickened my pace, determined to confront this fandom, to prove once and for all whether it was Sam or just a figment of my imagination. But as I approached, they turned and walked away, melting into the shadows with a familiarity that chilled me to the bone, first rang calling out Sam's name. But when I turned the corner where they disappeared, I found myself alone on an empty street. The encounters left me rattled, questioning my sanity. I became obsessed with the idea that Sam was following me, a thought as comforting as it was terrifying. Was it guilt, a desire for closure, or something more sinister? I couldn't understand why they would do this, why they would torment me with their presence only to vanish whenever I got too close. Driven by a mix of desperation and determination, I decided to lay a trap. I spread the word through mutual friends that I would be at a specific bar on a specific night, hoping the lure would be too strong for Sam to resist. The night arrived, and with it, a storm of emotions. I waited, scanning the faces of every patron, looking for that familiar figure. And then there they were, standing at the opposite end of the bar, watching me with an intensity that took my breath away. Our eyes met, and for a moment, the world fell away leaving only the two of us a bubble of shared history and pain. I made my way through the crowd, my heart pounding, every step bringing me closer to the confrontation I both craved and feared. But just as I reached the spot where Sam stood, they were gone, slipping away into the night as if they'd never been there at all. In their place, I found a note, written in Sam's unmistakable handwriting. I'm sorry it read. For everything, I can't face you, not yet but I needed to see you to know that you're okay. Please forgive me. The note was a small comfort, a tangible piece of evidence that I wasn't losing my mind. Sam had been there, watching over me, unable to let go, just as I was unable to move on. It didn't bring closure, but it brought understanding. We were both ghosts, haunting the places we'd once shared, unable to fully exist in a world without each other. In time, the sighting stopped. Life moved on as it has a way of doing. I found new routines, new joys, and eventually new love, but the memory of those ghostly encounters stayed with me, a bittersweet reminder of the love we'd shared and the pain of its passing. Sam would always be a part of me, a shadow lingering in the corners of my heart, a ghost only I could see. Story 11 Moving to our secluded farm was supposed to be the beginning of a new chapter for us, a return to the simple, 
honest life away from the hustle and bustle of the city, the sprawling acres of land, the rustic charm of farmhouse. It was everything we dreamed of for raising our children, Mia and Jake. But our idyllic retreat soon turned into a nightmare, all because of a boundary dispute with our neighbors, the Harrisons. It started innocently enough with Mr. Harrison claiming a portion of our land based on old property lines that supposedly predated any current maps. We tried to handle it amicably, offering to have professional surveyors reassess the boundaries, but our attempts at peace were met with hostility. The dispute quickly escalated, from heated arguments to the Harrisons threatening to make us regret moving here. Then the vandalism started. Our mailbox was smashed, tires on our truck were slashed, and sinister messages were left on our doorstep. We installed security cameras, hoping to catch the culprits in the act, but they were clever. Always just out of frame or met, the local police were sympathetic, but explained without concrete evidence. Their hands were tied. The situation reached a boiling point one crisp autumn night. We awoke to the sound of breaking glass downstairs. My heart raced as I grabbed the baseball bat we kept by the bed and crept down the stairs, my husband Tom, close behind. The living room window was shattered, a brick lying among the pieces, a note tied around it with a simple, chilling message. Leave now or suffer. We were terrified, not just for our property, but for our children's safety. We decided to stand our ground, unwilling to be driven from our home by threats. We reinforced our windows, installed better locks, and Tom started keeping his hunting rifle by the bed. The farm no longer felt like a sanctuary, but a fortress. But the true horror was yet to come. One evening, as we were settling down, the power cut out. Not unusual for rural living, but the timing felt ominous. Then we saw them, figures moving in the darkness outside. The glow of torches approaching the Harrisons and some others from the community. Faces twisted in anger, emboldened by mob mentality. They surrounded the house, shouting threats, throwing rocks, demanding we come out and face them. We huddled in the living room, the kids crying. As I dialed 911, praying the police would arrive in time, Tom loaded his rifle not to attack, but to protect, to show we wouldn't be intimidated into submission. For hours, we waited, the siege continuing until the early hours of the morning when the distant sirens finally scattered the mob. The police arrived to a war zone, our home battered, but our family unbroken. The aftermath was a blur of statements, investigations, and a community divide. The Harrisons were arrested, along with several others, charged with vandalism, trespassing, and assault. The boundary dispute was settled in court, the judge ruling in our favor, but the victory was hollow. We had won the battle, but at the cost of our peace of mind and our love for the place we once called home. In the end, we decided to sell the farm. The dream of a peaceful country life shattered by the reality of human cruelty. We moved away, not in defeat, but in search of a new beginning. Somewhere we could feel safe again. Somewhere we could rebuild the tranquility that had been so brutally torn from us. This experience taught us the value of community and the destructive power of unchecked anger. We learned that home is not just a place, but a feeling of safety and love. Something we vowed to create wherever life took us next. Story 12. Living in a small town where everyone knows your name and your business was a double-edged sword. It provided a sense of community and belonging, but it also meant that when trouble came, it hit close to home for everyone. Our trouble started one crisp bottom evening when the old mill on the outskirts of town went up in flames. It was a shock to us all. The mill had been abandoned for years, a relic of a bygone era, but it was part of our town's history, a landmark that now lay in ruins. The fire department ruled it arson, a deliberate act that sent ripples of fear through our community. But it was the discovery at the scene that turned fear into a full-blown terror. Bring to the charred remains of the mill's front door was a note, a cryptic message that read, the flame purifies, and the game has just begun. Story 15. When we first laid eyes on the old house at the end of Maple Street, it was love at first sight. Despite its dilapidated state, my partner and I saw a potential in its ancient bones. A chance to build our dream home from the remnants of its storied past, we eagerly embarked on the renovation, unaware of the dark secrets that lay hidden within its walls. The discovery was made on a humid afternoon, 
as we tore down the decrepit wallpaper of what would become our library. Behind the plaster, a small door revealed itself, cleverly concealed and easily overlooked. Her excitement at finding a hidden room was palpable. A secret space untouched by time, or so we thought. As we pried the door open, a musty smell wafted out, carrying with it the weight of undiscovered history. The room was small, barely more than a closet, but what it contained was far from ordinary. Stacks of old, yellowed newspapers lined the walls, alongside meticulously kept journals and an array of photographs that sent shivers down my spine. Each journal entry detailed a crime, complete with newspaper clippings as proof of their occurrence. The photographs, though faded, depicted various locations around our small town, each marked with a chilling precision. The realization hit us like a cold wave. Our dream home had once belonged to someone with a dark predilection for crime. The previous owner, it seemed, had not only kept a record of their macabre interests, but had possibly been involved in the very acts documented within these walls. A fear and fascination battled within us as we poured over the contents of the hidden room. The evidence suggested a series of crimes connected to the previous owner, each more disturbing than the last. We knew we had to act. Contacting the authorities, we handed over the evidence, hoping it would shed light on unsolved mysteries that had haunted our town for years. The investigation that followed was swift and thorough. It turned out that the previous owner had been a suspect in a series of disappearances, but had died before any concrete evidence could be brought against them. Their discovery provided the missing link, finally bringing closure to families who had long ago lost hope. The revelation of our home's dark past was a shock to the community, casting a shadow over our initial joy in the renovation. Yet, in unearthing these secrets, we had had inadvertently served justice. The hidden room was sealed once again, this time forever, as we endeavored to cleanse the home of its sinister history and start anew. But the house, with its ancient walls and creaking floors, never quite felt the same. Sometimes, in the dead of night, we would wonder about the stories it held, about the lives that had passed through its doors, but Dream Home had become a testament to the fact that some secrets are better left undiscovered. Story 16 The city had always been a symbol of freedom to me, a vast expanse of culture and history waiting to be explored. As a foreign tourist, my thirst for adventure had led me to its heart, eager to immerse myself in its vibrant streets and hidden gems. Little did I know, this thirst would soon plunge me into a nightmare, far removed from the picturesque scenes I had envisioned. As my journey into darkness began with a simple decision, to hail a cab, an act so mundane yet fatefully consequential. The driver, a seemingly friendly local, offered a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes, a detail I overlooked in my eagerness to see the city through the eyes of a resident. Our initial exchange of pleasantries soon turned into a one-sided conversation with my questions about local sites met with vague responses and, eventually, silent. It was the familiar landmarks faded behind us, replaced by narrow, deserted streets that whispered secrets in the dusk. A chilling realization dawned on me. We were no longer in the city I had come to explore, but its shadow, a place where the rules of the tourist guides no longer applied, where protests and demands to be taken back were ignored, the cab driver's demeanor shifting from indifferent to threatening. The moment the car came to a halt, I knew I had been drawn into a web from which escape would not be easy. Dragged into a dilapidated building that reeked of despair and forgotten dreams, I was confronted with the grim reality of my situation. Kidnapped, far from home, and at the mercy of those who saw me not as a person but as an opportunity for profit. Its days turned into an endless cycle of fear and hopelessness, the grimy walls of my prison a constant reminder of my vulnerability. My captor, a man who wielded control with a cold efficiency, made it clear that my release was contingent on a ransom, a price set on my freedom, rounded by faces that showed no kindness. Only the hardened indifference of survival. I realized that if I were to have any chance of escape, it would be through my own cunning. It's in the gloom of captivity, I began to observe, to listen, and to learn. The language of the streets, the currency of fear and power, became my tools. I watched the interactions between my captors and their cohorts, the exchange of information and goods, memorizing patterns and routines. It was a game of mental chess, 
with my life as the stake. When the mistake was made, the door left unlocked in a moment of oversight. I seized my chance. My heart racing, I stepped into the night, the city's oppressive darkness now my only ally. Every step was fraught with danger. Every yet the desire to reclaim my freedom, to step back into the light, propelled me forward. Navigating the city's underbelly was a test of endurance and stealth. I moved with purpose, avoiding the well-lit avenues in favor of the shadowed alleys, using the cacophony of the night to mask my movements. The city, a labyrinth of secrets and lies, was both my prison and my path to salvation. After what felt like hours, the familiar sounds and lights of the city's heart began to emerge from the darkness. The sight of tourists, blissfully unaware of the shadows that lurked just beyond their sight, filled me with a mix of relief and sorrow. I traversed the depths of fear and emerged on the other side, but the city would forever hold a dual meaning for me. A place of beauty marred by the darkness of its hidden corners. My escape was not just a physical journey, but a transformation. The city, with its stark contrasts and hidden dangers, had forced me to confront the depths of my own resilience. I had looked into the face of fear and chosen to fight, to survive, and to tell my tale. As I stepped back into the light, the nightmare receded into the shadows, a stark reminder of the fragility of safety and the strength of the human spirit. The city, for all its beauty, now bore scars that mirrored my own, a testament to the journey from darkness back into the light. For story 17, the tranquility of our suburban neighborhood was its crown jewel, a serene enclave where families thrived and community bonds were strong. It was the last place anyone would expect a wave of fear to sweep through, altering our lives forever. The home invasions began subtly, almost imperceptibly, with reports of missing valuables and vandalized properties. But as the incidents grew more frequent and brazen, a chilling pattern emerged, casting a shadow over our once peaceful community. Initially, we all suspected outsiders, transient figures drawn by the affluence and seemingly easy targets of our neighborhood. The police increased patrols and neighborhood watch groups were formed. Our collective efforts focused on safeguarding our homes against the perceived external threat. However, the breakthrough in the case came from an unexpected source, a careless mistake by one of the perpetrators leading to a discovery that would shake the very foundation of our community. The culprits were not outsiders, but our own teenagers who had grown up within the very fabric of our neighborhood. Children who had played in our streets and whose families we knew well. The revelation was a gut punch, a betrayal that left us questioning how well we truly knew our neighbors and the youth we were raising. As the investigation deepened, the motive behind the invasions became horrifyingly clear. This was not a mere spree of petty crimes, but a calculated series of acts driven by a sinister plot. The teenagers, disillusioned and seeking thrills beyond the mundane life of suburban conformity, had formed a pact. They aimed to sow chaos and fear to disrupt the very sense of security that our community prided itself on. It was a game to them, each invasion another level to conquer, their actions fueled by disturbing detachment from the consequences of their deeds. The community's reaction was a mixture of anger, disbelief, and profound sadness. How had we failed these youths so gravely that they felt compelled to lash out in such a destructive manner? Meetings were held, not just with law enforcement, but within the community itself, as we grappled with the underlying issues that had led to such a betrayal. The invasions had exposed a deep-seated rot within our seemingly perfect neighborhood. A reminder that behind the manicured lawns and friendly smiles, there were fractures we had chosen to ignore. Or in the aftermath, as the teenagers faced legal consequences for their actions, our neighborhood embarked on a painful path of introspection and healing. Initiatives were launched to bridge the gap between generations to foster dialogue and understanding in hopes of preventing a recurrence of such a tragedy. Security measures were strengthened, but more importantly, so were the bonds between neighbors, as we collectively vowed to rebuild the trust that had been shattered. Yet, the scars remained, a haunting reminder of the fragility of our idyllic suburban existence. The home invasions had not just been a series of crimes, they were a wake-up call, 
a reflection of the hidden darkness that could lurk in the most unexpected place. Our neighborhood would eventually find its way back to a semblance of normalcy, but the innocence once taken for granted was lost forever, a casualty of the sinister plot that had grown from within. February 18. The day I decided to leave him was the day I thought I had finally taken back control of my life. Little did I know, it was only the beginning of a nightmare that would blur the lines between reality and paranoia. He had always been possessive, but his transition from a bitter ex to a shadow that haunted every step I took was something I could have never anticipated. It started subtly, strange occurrences that I initially dismissed as coincidences. My email account would log out inexplicably or my social media would show activity I didn't remember. Friends began to receive messages I hadn't sent, sowing seeds of confusion and doubt in my relationships. It was only when I received an email from myself, detailing my daily routines with chilling accuracy, that the horrifying truth dawned on mess. He was using his expertise in technology to stalk me. My smartphone, once a lifeline, had become a leash. He had installed spyware that tracked my every move, listened to my conversations, and accessed my personal information. The realization that he was omnipresent, lurking in the devices that surrounded me, sent chills down my spine, first my home, my car, even my workplace. Nowhere was safe. He had crafted a digital cage around me, invisible to others but all too real for me. The police were sympathetic but powerless without concrete evidence of harm. The legal system seemed ill-equipped to handle the insidious nature of cyberstalking, leaving me to fend for myself in a battle I felt ill-prepared for. A sense of security was shattered. Every beep of a notification, every unexpected email, made my heart race with fear. I tried to outsmart him, changing passwords, replacing devices, even going as far as to erase my digital footprint. But with each move I made, he was always two steps ahead. His message is growing more menacing, reminding me that he was watching, always watching. Isolation became my reality. I withdrew from social media, distanced myself from friends and family to protect them from becoming collateral damage in his twisted game. The vibrant life I once led was reduced to a series of calculated steps to avoid detection, a constant state of hypervigilance. But in my darkest moments, when surrender seemed like the only option, a flicker of defiance ignited within me. I refused to let him define my existence, to be reduced to a victim in his narrative. With the help of a cybersecurity expert, I began to reclaim my digital life piece by piece. It was a painstaking process, filled with setbacks and victories, but with each security measure put in place, I felt a sliver of my freedom return. The battle is far from over, and the scars of this ordeal will linger. But I've learned that resilience lies in the refusal to be silenced, to fight back against the shadows with light. Herpy, you are become an advocate for victims of cyberstalking, sharing my story not as a tale of victimhood, but as a beacon of hope for those facing their darkness. In the end, this experience has taught me that control is not something to be wielded over others, but something to be cultivated within oneself. And while the journey back to myself is fraught with reminders of the past, I walk it with the knowledge that I am not alone. And Story 19. Our family camping trip to the national park was supposed to be a retreat from the hustle and bustle of city life, a chance to reconnect with nature and each other. The park, with its sprawling forests and serene lakes, promised a peaceful escape. However, what we encountered in the depths of the wilderness turned our idyllic getaway into a harrowing tale of survival. It began as an adventure. We set up camp near a clear stream, the sounds of the forest a soothing backdrop to our laughter and stories. The first night passed peacefully under the starlit sky, but by the second day, a sense of unease began to creep over us. It started with small, inexplicable occurrences. Items moved from where we left them, faint footprints not matching any of our shoes surrounding our campsite, and distant, unsettling noises that pierced the tranquility of the night. We tried to brush off our growing apprehension, attributing it to the wild imagination of city dwellers unaccustomed to the wilderness. But our attempts to rationalize the strange events were shattered when we saw him. A figure so wild and untamed it was hard to believe he was human. His eyes, wide and furl, watched us from the shadows, his presence sending a chill down our 
the realization that we were not alone, that someone, or something, was living in the wilderness with us, transformed our adventure into a nightmare. This feral human, as we came to call him, seemed to be everywhere and nowhere, his ghostly appearances by our campsite becoming more frequent and bold. It was clear he was observing us, but his intentions were unknown. Fear took hold as we debated leaving, but the situation escalated before we could act. One evening, as dusk turned to darkness, he came closer than ever before. His ragged appearance spoke of a life spent in the wild, far removed from civilization. His sudden guttural scream pierced the night, freezing us in place. It was a sound so primal, so filled with anguish and aggression, that it shook us to our core. We spent the night huddled together, too afraid to sleep, jumping at every rustle in the bushes. By morning, the decision to leave was unanimous. But the forest, once a place of beauty, now seemed labyrinthine and hostile as we hurriedly packed our belongings. The feeling of being watched was palpable. Our journey back to civilization was fraught with paranoia. Every snap of a twig, every shadow, felt like a threat. The wilderness had transformed from a haven into a haunting maze, with the feral human lurking just out of sight. It wasn't until we emerged from the forest's edge, the park ranger station in view, that we allowed ourselves to breathe a sigh of relief. The ranger listened to our story with a somber expression, nodding as if our encounter confirmed something he already knew. He spoke of rumors, tales of a man who had disappeared into the wilderness years ago, a soul lost to the forest. Whether he became feral by choice or necessity, no one could say, but our story added another chapter to the legend of the National Park. Our family returned to the city, but the wilderness stayed with us, a haunting memory of our brush with the primal side of nature. The experience became a reminder of the thin veneer that separates civilization from wilderness and how easily one can cross into the realm of survival horror. Story 20 I've always been fascinated by the stories that linger in the shadows, those unsolved mysteries that seem to beckon with a cold, ghostly finger. That's why I started my podcast, a deep dive into the cases that time in the public eye had forgotten. is not just a passion, but a calling. Little did I know, this path would lead me straight into the crosshairs of someone who preferred their deeds remain buried in the dark. It began with an anonymous tip a message left in the dead of night on my secure line. The voice, distorted and almost whispering, spoke of a case from decades ago, a series of disappearances in a small, seemingly innocuous town, the kind of place where everyone knows your name, or so they say. The caller claimed the truth had been covered up, that the person responsible was not only still out there but held a position of power hiding in plain sight. My interest peaked. I packed my bags and set off to the sleepy town, recorder in hand, ready to peel back the layers of time and secrecy. The air in the town was thick with a sense of unease that one could almost mistake for the humidity clinging to your skin. As I started digging, asking questions that hadn't been asked in years, I could feel the weight of unseen eyes on me, watching, calculating. The deeper I went, the clearer it became that this was no ordinary case. Clues started to piece together, forming a picture that was as horrifying as it was unbelievable. It wasn't just about the disappearances. It was about control, fear, and a predator enjoying the thrill of the hunt, hidden behind a mask of respectability and community service. Then the warnings began. Notes left under my hotel room door, my equipment tampered with, my car's brakes mysteriously failing. It was clear. Someone wanted me gone, wanted me silent. But the truth has a way of clawing its way out of the deepest graves, and I was too close to turn back now. One night, as I was poring over my notes and recordings trying to piece together the final parts of the puzzle, I heard it. A soft tapping at the window, persistent, like the ticking of a clock counting down the final moments of calm before the storm. I approached cautiously, only to see a figure cloaked in the shadows, the faint glimmer of a blade catching the moonlight's kiss. At that moment, everything came into sharp focus. The killer wasn't just trying to scare me off. They were coming to finish the job, to add me to the list of secrets this town kept so well. My heart raced as I realized this was no longer just an investigation. It was a fight for survival, a deadly game of cat and mouse where the stakes were my life. I managed to escape that night, my resolve hardened like steel. 
the story I had to tell was no longer just about the past. It was about the present, a warning of the danger that lurks in the heart of small towns, and the lengths some will go to keep their darkness covered. But this story isn't over. It's just another chapter in the endless struggle between light and darkness, truth and secrecy. And as I continue to share these tales, to shine a light on the shadows, I do so knowing the risk, carrying the weight of the unseen scars, and the knowledge that sometimes, the most dangerous stories are the ones that are true.